Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our equestrian webinar dedicated to saddle fitting and its importance. Uh, just a couple of words uh, about our organization before we begin uh, the webinar itself. Uh, our department is uh, the Department for International Trade. Uh, it uh, actually helps UK businesses uh, to export. It drives uh, outward and inward investment, negotiates uh, market access and trade deals. In uh, Russia, we help to develop trade relations between uh, the United Kingdom and Russian Federation. And what we do, you can see it at the slide. Uh, we look for British uh, suppliers at the request of Russian companies. Uh, we look for Russian business partners at the request of uh, British companies. We organize business visits and uh, trade delegations from the UK to Russia in order to get acquainted with Russian regions and establish business contacts with Russian companies. For example, in September last year, we brought uh, six British companies to Russia, headed uh, with uh, the executive director of British Equestrian Trade Association, Claire. Um, and uh, during this uh, uh, visit, they got to know about the state of uh, the equestrian industry in Russia and uh, uh, met representatives of Russian Equestrian Federation, uh, visited equestrian clubs in Moscow and St. Petersburg. You can see some photos <laughs> at the screen and also met some potential Russian buyers. Also, we organize uh, business visits to, from Russia to the UK, including visits to the trade shows and individual programs for business meetings. Uh, for example, January this year, we organized a business mission to Birmingham, uh, Birmingham and Yorkshire to show Russian companies uh, UK equestrian industry this time and to introduce them to British manufacturers of uh, horse equipment, horse feet and clothing. And also we are engaged in organizing a sector specialized events, round tables, conferences, and uh, uh, if you want to know more about our future chain of equestrian events, uh, please follow on our news. So now let me introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, Claire Williams, Executive Director of British Equestrian Trade Association, and Nikki Newcomb, Managing Director of Bliss of London. And I'm pleased to give the floor, in our case, it's the screen to Claire. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sradzvitya, everybody. It's lovely to um, be talking to you all. Um, yeah. Katra, I think you need to um, yes. give me the screen. Right. Lovely. Um, as Katja said, I'm the Executive Director of the British Equestrian Trade Association. Um, uh, we're delighted to be working with the British Embassy um, on this webinar and hopefully future webinars on other equestrian topics. Um, I'm briefly going to give you some background about BETA, what BETA is, what we do, um, and a bit about the market here in the UK in case any of you would like to come and see it for yourselves uh, before handing over to Nikki to talk about the main topic today, saddle fitting. And so Great Britain has a long reputation and a well-established reputation for equestrianism in all its forms. From some of the most iconic races in the world to badminton horse trials, BETA undertakes research every four years into the size and scale of our industry. Um, these are some of the pictures from our 2019 survey, which reveals that in the UK we have 3 million riders, we have 1.8 million people that ride less often than every month, and we have 847,000 horses. Um, and these are owned by nearly 375,000 households. Um, the equestrian industry is very important to our economy, um, and there is a total spend from the leisure sector of 4.7 billion pounds, um, and when you combine that with the um, amount spent on keeping and training racehorses, that amount increases nearly to, uh, to £8 billion. Pounds. So a significant contributor to the economy. BETA is the trade association for manufacturers and suppliers of equestrian equipment to customers around the world. And our role is to help our members develop markets overseas. 
Beta was founded in 1978 and we currently have a membership of 850 manufacturers and retailers and other organisations. We also have a number of overseas manufacturers and retailers who like to be associated with Beta to take advantage of some of the services that we can offer overseas. We work alongside equestrian bodies such as the British Equestrian Federation and key disciplines including dressage, show jumping and eventing. We also offer training on a wide range of topics including saddle fitting and we take these courses overseas um, most recently to Australia and New Zealand last year. Um, we are also looking at doing similar when we get over COVID-19 of bringing our courses to Russia both on saddle fitting but also on other topics such as safety equipment and feeding specifically to avoid prohibited substances. And most importantly we provide a voice for the equestrian trade here in the UK and throughout Europe. An important part of what we do as well is help our members develop their, their new export markets. Um, and this just says what else we do. We're very um, active in lobbying and representation to our government. Um, we run a number of accreditation schemes, the logos of which you can see there. Our NOPS logo indicates feed that is safe to feed to competition horses. And the blue logo is what goes on body protectors, which is an international scheme um, ensuring that the garments that you wear um, in terms of body protectors are safe and fit for purpose. What we do is similar to what Katya does and we were really pleased to work with Katya and her team last year in September and then in January this year, um, helping companies, both UK groups, go to overseas uh, trade shows and other events and also helping delegates from overseas markets come in to the UK. We provide market information specifically from the UK but we also have information on other markets around the world and our key tool within the UK for doing this is Beta International, the trade fair that we run in January, towards the end of January um, and that attracts buyers from around the world and exhibitors from around the world and we were pleased to host the group that Katya led in January this year. Um, luckily before COVID hit um, and at the picture below you can see the representative from the Russian Equestrian Federation. Clara, sorry, it, it looks like everything's fine now. Thank you. Oh good, sorry. right. Technical problems are my nightmare. <laughs> So, as I say, Beta International is the leading equestrian trade fair of its type. We are moving location next year to a more rural environment on Stonely Park, which is the National um, Agricultural Exhibition Centre. Um, and it, well, that will take place from the 24th to the 26th of January. Um, we were hoping to um, host another Russian group, which depending on how um, funding arrangements go, we may well be able to. But we'll be working with the um, British Embassy in Moscow again to facilitate that, we hope. Um, Beta International is a fantastic location to find new products, meet um, British suppliers as well as other countries, but specifically British suppliers, and see really what makes um, British business so successful in the supply of equestrian equipment. Um, we host over 3,000 trade visitors with nearly 300 exhibitors um, from saddlery, um, equestrian and clothing as well as horse equipment and safety and it really offers a fantastic showcase to new and innovative products and entry is free to trade visitors. So um, this is the group of what looks like very happy Russian um, buyers this year um, and that was fantastic to be able to show them really the best of what we have to offer. Now I'd like to hand over to Nikki to talk about, I'm sure, what you're really interested in, which is um, saddle fitting, the importance and why you need a correctly fitted saddle. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, Katya, if you can just share the screen to me, then I can move on the slides. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. And thank you, Katya and Claire, for asking me to... Uh, speak on our topic today which is a correctly fitting saddle and why that is important. Um, 
Oh, I can't see the arrows to move the slides. Nikki, if you move your logo, your cursor down to the bottom where that little screen with yeah. like a half move something is. Presentation one, yeah. Yeah, uh, half, I got it. It. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I'm Nikki Newcomb. I'm the founder of Bliss of London Saddles. Um, I am a horse rider myself. I've ridden pretty much all my life. I do a bit of eventing. Um, so having a saddlery business and being a rider and a qualified saddle fitter hopefully gives me some good insight and background to be able to talk to you today about saddle fitting. So a little bit of history on saddles. Um, the UK has probably the most history like any, no other country. Um, it dates back hundreds of years um, where saddle making has been predominant in London and more so in Warsaw itself, which is in the centre of the UK. Um, we, the craft of a saddle maker is a skill that takes many, many years to develop. Um, some factories nowadays break that process down. Smaller factories will still keep that on a from start to finish process for one saddle maker producing a saddle from start to finish. But there are lots of different processes. Over the years, saddle design and developments have changed dramatically. Um, you'll look at the top um, selection of images there and you will see the differences in some of the old saddles from the very narrow gullets or channels um, to the more modern, wider ones. Um, the difference between the panel shapes underneath the saddle, you will see the top picture has a very slim, narrow, not supportive um, back gusset. Um, the modern ones are much more extensive. Um, then the seats themselves for the riders, um, provide much more support and comfort nowadays. Years ago, one saddle fitted every horse and it fitted every rider. But we do expect so much more nowadays from our riders, from our horses and the disciplines that we choose. And therefore, we are able to design saddles that are discipline specific to help those needs. So modern manufacturing um, has changed historically from years ago as well. This, you still probably won't see an awful lot of machinery and technology. Um, the majority of it is still very handcraft based. Um, and that allows us to produce those individual components and elements for custom saddle making. Trees themselves, we will talk about trees later in a lot more detail. But tree manufacturing is probably where we've seen a lot of um, difference from years ago with the different profiles of trees, the way that they're produced with the machinery that they are produced for the symmetry and the accuracy. Um, so we will talk about those a bit later. Along with the saddles for different disciplines, there are lots of things you can do now with different saddles. You can have different flap lengths, different flap positions. This slide helps to illustrate some of the different things that you can do when you need more forward flaps for taller riders. Cross country riding tends to have a shorter stirrup position than obviously a dressage saddle. So saddles need to be designed and developed to fit the rider as well as fitting the horse. Cantle options, that's the piece at the back of the saddle um, where you will see different angles of cantle and depths of cantle and that helps create the seat form and the seat shape. So jump saddles traditionally have flatter seats to allow more freedom in the saddle, whereas you'll see dressage saddles have much taller cantles. And when we're out with saddle fitters, um, sorry, as saddle fitters, when we're out with clients, this is where you're able to discuss with the client 
how they feel in the saddle and what they like, what they don't like, what feels supportive for them um, and being able to understand what can be done to build a saddle or which saddle to choose that you have in stock that's going to be most appropriate for them to support them and then in turn be of a benefit for them for their riding. If a rider doesn't feel comfortable in a saddle then they are not going to feel balanced and that in turn is not going to help the horse. So you can see this is just a little example of a rider in a saddle, the same rider, different days, um, where she's got quite a long leg and her knee is over the front of the saddle. And then when she had one made, she had it with a more forward flat so that that accommodated her leg position and her knee in a much better place for her and the block was supporting her then. So this slide just again shows a few different examples of things that we can do to help riders, the flap projection, the blocks, Velcro blocks, you will often see Velcro blocks used on saddles so that they can be moved and repositioned, small blocks, or much larger blocks depending upon sometimes it's down to experience of the rider if they are a very competent um, professional rider they may not require as much block um, whereas more novice riders might prefer a much larger block for the support these blocks can be changed on dressage saddles as well so again with different leg lengths different angles you are able to adjust that um, to be able to help support the rider. Okay, so one of the key things to remember is one saddle does not fit everything. Years ago, we used to take that impression um, and I still have saddles, very old saddles myself that seem to just fit on everything that we put it on. But nowadays, we see such a variety of breeds and profiles of horses um, that we are fortunate to be able to have saddles in the marketplace that are specialized for certain types of breeds. So if you take, for example, um, the bottom right picture, which is a draft type, heavy type horse, in comparison to the one directly above it, which is a thoroughbred, um, those two profiles are very different um, and therefore we are able to have saddles to suit those different types of profiles. So it's about thinking what type of horse you have, depending on your um, profession, whether you are here today as a vet or a physio or a rider, um, or a fitter, um, if you do ride, then think about the type of profile of your horse um, and what sort of width he is. You can see here just some very basic differences between a narrow fitting, a medium wide, and then a much wider saddle. And you'll see the difference there in the arch of the head and also in the width of the channel or the gullet that goes through. So what is the purpose of saddle fitting? The purpose of saddle fitting is to provide maximum bearing surface for the weight distribution of the rider um, and also the symmetry of the tree. The tree which is the chassis, like the chassis of a car, it's the chassis of a saddle. So it's about finding the symmetry to fit that horse's back profile to provide as much even pressure as possible. Horses give a lot of pressure as they come up into the saddle as much as the rider coming down and their weight pushing down on the saddle. Um, the area that we're looking to fit is the red area on the top left picture. So we are looking to fit the saddle behind the back of the scapula. We're looking at about two inches behind the back of the scapula for where the tree point of the saddle is going to sit. 
So it's not necessarily the front of the saddle, it's the solid part of the saddle, which is the point of the tree. Um, that's usually around the eighth, the eighth um, thoracic vertebrae. And then it must not extend past where the red arrow indicates, which is the 18th thoracic vertebrae. Um, that is the area. Sorry, thought I heard somebody ask a question. Um, that's the area that we are looking to fit within there. Um, obviously, this in itself sometimes causes difficulties because if you've got quite short backed horses, or if you may have larger riders on smaller horses then it becomes a difficult area because we do not want to go into that green area which is the lumbar area because that has no support there to carry the weight of a saddle and this is sometimes where you might see saddles that have been too long on a horse um, and then the horse begins to find you know create back pain and have difficulties in its back and in its movement so there are eight key points of saddle fitting um, as a guide for anybody whether you're choosing to be a saddle fitter or not but just key eight points that you can check um, the initial feel the balance the width bridging clearance pressure, length and girthing, which we will now go through. So the initial feel, when you sometimes put a saddle onto a horse's back, it just sort of slides, it just sort of slots into place. And if you get that initial feel, it's a little bit sort of like a jigsaw, putting a jigsaw piece into a puzzle. It just feels right. Now, if you don't sort of get that initial feel and you can't sort of find that balance as to where it needs to be, you need feeling you need to move it, then it perhaps is not the correct saddle. So sometimes it's just that initial sort of gut feel that you get when you put a saddle onto a horse. Then you can look at the balance of the saddle. So if you even put your fingers on the front and the back of the saddle and put a little bit of pressure, do you get much rock? Does the saddle move up and down? Does it have a good balance? Yeah. Please remember that the pommel does not need to be level in the height of the cantle. If you have a dressage saddle which has a much taller cantle, then that will always be a little higher. It does not have to be level. It's about the general balance in the middle. <laughs> Obviously, you don't get any, any good questions. And you will see in these slides here that I think somebody might have their microphone on. I can hear a bit of background noise. I don't know if that's a problem catcher. <laughs> um, the central side slide here in the middle shows a really good balance. The, um, the roll of tape is sitting directly in the middle of the saddle. It's like a flat spot in the center. The saddle on the left hand side, the saddle is a little up at the back. The balance is down at the front and therefore the roll is rolling towards the front. Wow. Now, if you have a rider sat in a saddle like this, they're going to feel tilted forwards um, and they will compensate for that. This could be because the saddle is too wide. It's usually that the saddle is too wide and therefore it is tilting downwards. Or it could be that the saddle is the correct width but simply the panels are not the right shape for the horse's back profile. The image on the right hand side, the saddle potentially is too narrow and therefore it is sitting up at the top and it's rolling the tape towards the back. And so the rider is going to be sitting in the back of the saddle. Um, and that sitting in the back of the saddle is gonna put a lot more pressure into that back part of the saddle underneath the gussets. Um, so this is why it's important that we want the rider sat in the center of the seat so that it helps to distribute the weight. 
One of the, the third point to check is the tree width. So with most saddles, you will be able to lift the flap up and see where the point of the tree sits underneath. Um, and then if you run your hand underneath the tree point, so not the front of the saddle, but underneath that solid tree point, you should feel a nice even contact. If you feel quite tight at the top and then it gets easier, it potentially the saddle is too wide. Or if it feels quite loose at the top and then it gets tighter, the tree is probably too narrow. And you can often see the angle of the tree point. So if you look at it from the front, you'll be able to gauge the angle of the tree point and you're wanting to find that symmetry to where that is sitting on the horse and have that symmetry there. So this slide helps show what I was just trying to explain. So a saddle, this is the tree, the bear tree on an actual horse. So this is what you don't see going on inside your saddle. Um, so the top slide is too narrow and you can see there is a gap at the top and then it starts to create pressure at the bottom. The middle image is a nice parallel symmetry angle. And then the bottom one is too wide. So sometimes people think that it is a good idea to have a saddle that's too wide because it's better than too narrow. But you can see with the way the tree sits here that you're actually going to cause as much pressure at the top by the spine, um, which can equally cause as much damage as a tree that's too narrow. Bridging. Bridging is a term that we use to describe when you have a four point pressure. So bridging is the gap in the middle underneath the saddle where sometimes you'll actually see daylight. So the saddle is fitting at the front and at the back in four points and you have this gap going through the middle. Um, some saddles is fine. For them to bridge while the horse is stood still because the horse may then engage and bring his back up and you may lose some of that bridging but ideally you want a nice even contact throughout the panel of that saddle so that again this is an, in, uh, an example of a tree that is bridging on this horse so you can see where you've got a four point pressure at the front and the back and then you have no contact from the tree um, throughout the middle of the saddle. So as the pressure comes down on this, you're going to have some pressure issues at the front and back. Then you must look for the clearance. And there's several places that you need to look for the clearance. There is the traditionally known clearance under the front of the pommel. We we sometimes talk about it as a three finger clearance, but depending on the profile of the withers, whether they're tall or whether they're flat and round, so long as it is sufficient clearance, and you can see the clearance going right the way down and through the gullet of the saddle, so long as it is not touching on the spine, then that is what we call sufficient clearance. And then it's important to remember at the back of the cantle, that you have clearance underneath there and it's not touching. And remember to check clearance when a rider is on the saddle because you might have a large rider, a heavy rider, that will sit the back of the saddle down quite a lot to the point where you lose the clearance at the back that you had without the rider on board. And also the clearance around the top of the spine, the top of the withers. So where the panel finishes, to still then have that clearance either side of the wither. So not just at the top, but to have it either side as well. Okay, so you can see with a couple of these pictures where you're getting quite sort of a, a tight, tight panel contact at the top of the panel on this saddle you'd probably like to see the picture on the left a little lower and a little wider 
so that the panel wasn't touching quite so closely to the top of the spine. And then at the back, on the back saddle of that, is probably getting a little low in the cantle clearance as well. So then you need to check the pressure of the panel and the bars. So you need to hold the saddle at the front and run your hand flat right the way up the front under where the tree point is, along the stirrup, under where the stirrup bar. This is often an area where you will find saddles are very tight. The stirrup bars can be placed in different um, closeness to the tree to the tree and therefore to the spine of the horse and so it must have that free sweep of clearance under the panel you need to be able to run your hand and just freely flow underneath the saddle um, and it's a really good practice to go and have a look at some saddles on different horses and do this and you will be surprised that even just the tightness of a stirrup bar you simply cannot get your hand past that point, even without it girthed or without a rider sat on top. So you can imagine how much extra pressure when you've got a rider on board. Everything you do, of course, remember to do on both sides because not all horses are symmetrical, so it might fit very nicely on one side, but not the other. Then we need to talk about the T18, which I mentioned earlier. T18 is quite, for the vets that are here, <laughs> I'd like to know the definitive answer of exactly how you find T18. It is quite difficult. Um, but generally, you can feel the last 18th rib on a horse. And if you run your hand diagonally up and follow that 18th rib pattern, and then come up slightly straight, you will approximately find where T18 is in the back. It's not possible to actually feel T18, but you can be guided from the 18th rib. So on this horse, the white mark indicates where T18 is, and this saddle is encroaching past T18, which is not ideal. There are certain circumstances where if we have got a really or a larger rider for the size of the horse, for the size of saddle that the horse can really take, it is sometimes better to go a little bit past T18 in order to have a better weight distribution for the rider than to have the rider sat in a much smaller saddle and therefore sitting on the back of the saddle, which is going to cause much more pressure in the back of the saddle area. And then finally, girthing. This is something not to be overlooked. There are many, many options for your girth straps. With dressage saddles, you will probably traditionally now see the first strap coming from the point of the tree. This can either come through the side of the roll at an angle so that you've got that V system girthing or for some horses that have got a slightly more forward girth position, you will find it comes vertically down and straight at the front as in this picture. Most of the back straps you will see on a V system nowadays because that helps with stability. So the, the wider the, the pull, from the seat of the saddle, the wider that bearing surface pull, the greater stability it will help with the girthing. And in some circumstances, you might not want the V girthing, you might just want a single strap for more stability. With horses or riders that are asymmetric, you might want to do something different on the left side to the right side. It is not always symmetrical. Um, so there's lots of different options with the girthing. With short straps, sometimes you will see five straps on one saddle. Usually this is when you've got very round um, shaped profiles, often on ponies, native type ponies and cobs. Anything with a very round barrel profile causes greater 
instability in the saddle. So again, the wider that system can be for the pull of the girthing, then hopefully that helps with the, with the stability for the saddle. And with girthing, don't, don't overlook the girths that the um, riders are using. Um, hopefully now we've got past the single sided girth um, elastic. If you're going to use elastic in a girth, make sure you always use it on the left side and the right side. It needs to have an equal pull. If you've got elastic on one side of your girth, it is going to give more so on that side than the other. And that doesn't help with any saddle slipping problems. Um, the wider the horse and the more slipping problems that you have, you are probably best not to have any elastic at all because then that won't allow any, any give or very little give in the girthing system. So look at the girth that people are using because that's just as important to see what equipment they're using, girth, pads and everything else. Um, because you can have a saddle that you've fitted perfectly and you're really happy with the fit and then you find they're using something else when you walk away and it causes problems. Okay, so just again a reminder, one saddle does not fit everything, unfortunately. If somebody's found the saddle that does, please let me know. So talk about horse profiles and the different types of horse profiles that we can have. I'm just going to take this down today into just sort of three main horse profiles, um, which I'm going to call the classic, the warm blood, and the hoop. And this helps to sort of give you, this slide helps to give you an idea of the type of profile. So your classic has a little bit of curve in its back, a more of an A-frame wither, and as you come along the back, the back stays quite pitched, quite angular. Whereas what we see now with a lot of the warm bloods, um, I've been fortunate to come over to Russia about four years ago. Um, so I've seen a, a lot of the clubs and stables in Russia, and I know predominantly you have war bloods there. There's not a lot of thoroughbreds. Um, there's some na a few natives. We did see some cobs, but it is predominantly warm blood horses. Um, and the warm blood tree, again, has an A-frame head. As the tree comes out, as the profile comes out, they come out and they're much flatter in the back. So the pitch there is very different to the classic pitch. And then the hoop tree is for more of your cobs and your natives. So again, a little bit of curve in the horizontal profile, but a much rounder template profile, a much lower wither, a more of a U shape, and very sort of rounded all the way through the back and generally quite a broader wider spine so we will go and have a look at now at some different profiles so here's some pictures of some classic tree um, type profile horses generally these are I would say our average horses in the UK um, moving towards the thoroughbred racehorses, off the track thoroughbreds. So they tend to be a lighter frame um, with a little bit of curve in their back and a relatively narrow spine in comparison to some of the other breeds. And this is a classic tree sitting on a horse. So you're looking for that symmetry of the rails. You're looking for that nice even contact of the rail which is the wooden piece here and this tree that's running along the centre of the saddle. So that's got a nice um, even contact. Warm blood horses, as I say, they tend to be still quite a frame. The warm bloods now, the sports horses we see, are lighter in their build than the warm bloods of 10, 20 years ago. They used to be a much heavier type of horse. So the lighter sports horses, they still have quite an A-frame, but then as you can see on the picture at the left, it comes much flatter in the back. 
And this is a warm blood tree. And you can see the flatness, the difference between the two slides, hopefully, um, of the rails at the back. And then hoop trees. So the horse on the, the pony, sorry, on the left is a, a fell pony, a native fell pony in the UK, a very, very round profile. And then the one on the right hand side is an Irish draft. And you will still see some warm bloods that are of the more Hanoverian type. And they are still very big and very solid. So some warm bloods will take a hoop tree or some manufacturers call them a freedom tree. Um, anything that's sort of a U-shaped head in the tree. And there's an example of a hoop tree on a back. We also talk about close contact trees. Now a close contact tree is a much smaller, neater tree. Um, so it allows for less panel, so you get a closer contact to the horse. Now this is what the riders like, because you get the nice feel, but it's only ever good if you have a horse's back that's got a good top line, a good profile, strong muscle mass, to be able to take less panel. Um, it's not the type of saddle or tree that you want to be using for hours of riding, but for jumping, show jumping perhaps, then that's why close contact panels are very popular. Um, but you need to have a good top line. You can't be using a close contact tree on a horse that has a very weak, very poor um, muscular top line. And this is why then sometimes you will see um, traditionally close contact saddles used with a number of saddle pads underneath. Be it one, two, three. I've literally seen them stacked on top of each other. Um, and then really what you're doing is you're taking away the close contact element of the saddle. So you may as well have had a saddle that fits properly in the first place so that you don't have to use all of the pads underneath. So there's a close contact tree. It's probably not the best angle to see that, but it's quite a neat, narrow seated tree. So you don't get as much panel underneath. We also now have synthetic um, plastic polymer synthetic trees available in the market. And you will find that most of these are on an adjustable system. So wooden trees can be adjusted one width fitting either way in a special machine. So there is a level of flexibility for adjustment. Um, but with the synthetic trees, they have interchangeable gullet bars so that either the fitter or the rider themselves, this is something that you can do yourself and change the width. So this is very useful for um, young horses that are changing and developing. Um, a common question I often get asked is, you know, my horse is a young horse, it's only four, should I be buying him a new saddle? Yes, definitely. Or at least finding a saddle that fits because it's so important in the early days of their development that they are comfortable in a saddle. Um, so having a, the adjustability with these sort of trees and gullet bars is great for young horses because as they change, then you can keep changing the width with them. So if we could just x-ray all of our saddles on our horses and find and know that we have that perfect symmetry, it would be wonderful. So it's just interesting to see and have a think about what tree, what is the chassis of your saddle on your horse. Again, here's some examples of what not to be and ideally what we are looking for. So you can see the tree above, it has very long tree points. It does not suit this back profile. If that was in a saddle that was being used, the saddle may look like it fits, but it's going to be causing intensive pressure on the horse's back. So when a saddle fitter comes out, ideally they're going to assess your horse and make sure it doesn't have any sort of real big pain issues. As saddle fitters, we're not vets. 
So if we see anything that we're not comfortable with, we will refer you to your vet. But if there's anything in the saddle fitting area that is going to cause us concern for fitting a saddle, we will point this out to you as a client. We're probably going to see your horse trotted up for movement just to make sure it looks level and sound. Um, we're going to watch you ride in the saddle because you cannot do a saddle fit from a static position. You have to see a saddle ridden in to see how the horse carries that saddle. And then we also need your opinion as a rider as to how you feel in the saddle. And then we will probably go forward and take templates. So templates are taken two inches, um, that's sorry, 10 centimeters behind the back of the scapula. So you can find, you can feel the back of the scapula. It's usually about sort of three fingers. So 10 centimeters, and that's where we take our template measurements. There's two key reasons that we take templates. Firstly, it's record keeping. So you know how that horse was on the day that you perhaps sold a saddle, ordered a saddle for them. You know the shape. That horse is maybe going to change if it's perhaps been in a saddle that it wasn't comfortable in. It was a bad saddle. Then hopefully that horse is going to develop. We want to see some muscle change and some development. Um, if it's a young horse, it's likely to change. So this is a record that you can keep. And then when you next go back and you see the horse, you template again so that you have a comparison between the two differences. And then if the rider isn't happy or if the horse isn't happy with the saddle in six months time and you have that record, it may be very obvious why the saddle no longer fits because the template will have changed considerably. Um, we also obviously need templates if you are going to have a saddle made to measure. This is the width that we need to set the tree to for the saddle. And you will see um, the difference in the channel widths um, uh, for the horse. The slide on the left is the tree that a lot of riders prefer because it's very narrow in the waist. And for the rider, that's going to feel a lot more comfortable. Whereas you can then see it isn't going to provide a sufficient clearance in the actual gullet of that saddle. The rails of the tree are there to support the panel. So the picture on the left is going to support the panel sufficiently under those rails and allow a wider gullet. So sometimes with English made saddles, the riders often feel that they're a bit wider, but it's for the benefit of the horse in this case. You can see in this slide the difference between the angles and the fronts of the trees. So changing horses again, you can see the horse, this is the same horse at four years old on the top where he was about a medium fit. And then at seven years old, he developed considerably um, to probably what was more like an extra wide fit. So not only in the width had he changed and he'd also changed a bit in his back profile. There's a lot of questions as to whether saddles should have wool or foam panels. Personally, I don't have a problem with foam panels so long as they fit. And then they need to fit for the future. So if that horse is going to change, there is not a lot you can do with a foam panel. You can't take away from it. You can't add to it. The huge benefit of wool filled panels is that they can be adjusted. So you can add some more as the horse develops, um, you can change it, you can quilt it, you can do lots of different things for adjustments. And wool is a breathable material, it will help with wicking properties um, and it's very good for impact and compression rates as well. So I did mention earlier, it's so important that you must see a saddle ridden in. You can never assess a saddle fit from a pure static um, fit. 
you'll see in the difference in these two slides, it's a good example of how a horse can engage their back from when they're stood statically to when they're being ridden, how much the back profile can change. So you must always see a horse ridden for saddle fit. So some signs that your saddle may not fit. It's very often we see horses, we walk into the stable with the saddle and the horse turns around, the ears come back, he's not happy, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that saddle is going to be uncomfortable for him and that's what he's telling you. The rider can feel that the saddle slips, it moves, it's unbalanced. Um, the horse just becomes difficult to ride, they don't want to go forwards, their gait changes their stride length changes, they may start to refuse jumping, they might have been very good at jumping and now they don't want to. Um, you can see the sweat patterns when you take the saddle off, you might see a different sweat pattern on one side to the other. You might start to see lumps under the saddle, muscle tone might start to change. White hairs are a good indication of a saddle problem but they're probably a several months ago when this happened it takes quite a long time for white hairs to come through just a general soreness back pain rider back pain is a very very good indication that the saddle doesn't fit um, a rider trying to compensate for the balance of the seat of a saddle is often going to sit themselves in a more unnatural position, which causes them pain. So often the balance of that saddle isn't correct. So if a rider struggles with back pain, it's definitely worth looking at the balance and the position of their saddle. So you can just, a few good indicators of uh, <laughs> the top, top left picture was a lady who, knew that she was not a good rider and unfortunately she was the cause of the saddle slip with this it was not the horse this horse being ridden by um, a more advanced rider the saddle sat beautifully on this horse but this was definitely a rider caused problem um, but hind limb lameness is often a big cause there's lots of research papers being done to show that hind limb lameness often causes saddle slip. So yes, it can be the saddle. There can be problems with the saddle, but it is more likely it is the horse that's causing the slip from asymmetry. And sometimes don't forget, it can be the rider. So here's some um, pictures. Um, what I do normally do is if I have sort of people in front of me, I do usually ask for feedback as what they think have caused these problems, but I'll just go through these with you today. So the top left picture, those white hairs were actually not saddle related. That's caused from a rug, a blanket. This is a very narrow withered horse, as you can see and the pressure over the top of the rug rubbing constantly has caused those problems. Um, the middle picture, that huge damage over the wither area there is actually from a polo saddle. And polo saddles traditionally are put very high up the withers. You will sometimes find as well that even show jumpers tend to prefer to have the saddles a little further forward than we ideally as saddle fitters would prefer. Um, but polo saddles are notorious for sitting very high and on the withers. And in this case, it caused a lot of damage on this horse. Um, the bottom uh, right picture, that callus, that actual hard mark there was caused from a stirrup bar pressure under the saddle. So unless you actually put your hand under the saddle to feel that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have known. Um, so that was the stirrup bar that had caused that amount of pressure to cause that problem there. Lots of lumps, bumps, some saddle related and some not. So to check your own saddle, you can look at the balance, the clearance, 
the seat size, your gullet width, don't forget your girthing. Um, the dirt marks on a saddlecloth, they can help. They're not a true indicator of right or wrong, but dirt marks on a saddlecloth can help see where there is extra pressure. And if you're in doubt, if you're not sure if it's the saddle, get somebody else to watch you ride or even get somebody else to ride in your saddle and do they have the same problems as you have? In which case, it may be you. So again, some examples of the different, look at your saddle, check. Do you have a wide enough, sufficient clearance in the gullet of your saddle? Or is it one of the very old fashioned styled saddles that's extremely narrow and gives no clearance around the spine? Make sure your saddle pad actually comes past the back of your saddle. Don't have it sitting directly under the area that you sit on top of, because this will cause a problem. This will rub the horse's back. Um, look at the girthing of your saddle. Make sure the angle of the girth is working with the angle of the straps to your saddle because otherwise it might pull the saddle forwards if it's not at the right angle. The straightness we've talked about again and just being too big in a saddle. Sometimes as saddle fitters, we do have to tell people they are too big. For the horse they are riding they won't like it but that's what you have to tell them because we can't fit a saddle for somebody that's big large man and he's riding a small pony it is just not possible um so yeah so look at the seat size of the riders and the, in relation to the horses Those are just some examples, again, of pictures, the bottom pictures where you don't have a good contact for the panel at the back. You can see there is a lot of pressure towards the edge of the panel and not so much on the inside. So that's going to cause problems. And in the bottom right hand corner, there is a lot of lift under the saddle. So that saddle is just going to bounce up and down as the rider rides in it. So finally, just as saddle fitters, we, as I said, we're not vets. We're, we're not other professionals necessarily. Some, some are. Um, but we like to work with other professionals. Saddle fitting is a holistic approach from every angle. The reason the saddle slips or there's problems, it could be a farrier issue. You might want a farrier to have a look at the hooves. That could be causing different shoulder levels, different shoulder positions. So work with the vets, the physios and other professionals that you have. And if there is a problem, do this as a team for the benefit of the horse. Right. I think that's about it. Happy riding. <laughs> OK, we're going to run some questions. Yeah, I was muted. So thank you, Blair. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, I think that uh, if we have any questions, it's right to the time when our audience can have this opportunity to ask whatever they want to ask. Uh, please uh, use the chat box and we will uh, read your questions. You had a super, Nikki. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, my Russian is rusty. <laughs> it would be interesting to know who's listening, whether we have vets or riders or fitters. <laughs> Elena. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, the question is uh, first question I will try to um, translate it because it's quite challenging uh, 
Okay. Uh, so uh, I suppose that questions about um, ah. tree, treeless, tree I guess, saddles. treeless tree saddles, saddles and yeah. ladies' saddles are not actual, are not relevant. Uh, I um, think she means side saddles. Ladies' saddle will be. Yeah, yeah, saddle. probably. Ladies' saddle. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for, for, for my uh, understanding. There's lots of Christians, room. Nikki. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, I'll try, I'll try and <laughs> cover the questions. Um, treeless saddles, first of all. Well, that's actually quite interesting because my daughter's pony, um, very, very little pony, has been out in the field and got very, very, very fat to the point where he does not fit in a normal saddle um so i have had to go and buy a treeless saddle <laughs> because he literally is like that wide um so there are there are definitely reasons that treeless saddles will benefit horses definitely on the wider horses um because there is no chassis there is no frame within that saddle i do think there has been research done that they can cause pressure points where the pressure from the stirrup bars come down over the saddle over the back of the horse so they're probably not the most ideal for doing competitive riding in um but yes in certain circumstances treeless saddles can be a good answer um side saddles my sister rides side saddle um so again for the length of time that you're riding or using a side saddle um it's it's fine on a horse you know it's again it's probably you're not going to go doing a high level competition in a side saddle and and they can be adjusted and there are different trees available for side saddles um so yes you can have made to measure side saddles And uh, I think that uh, our audience corrected me about barefoot saddles. Barefoot saddles, as far as I'm aware, are as similar to treeless saddles, where there isn't a chassis, a frame in the actual saddle. So it just forms its own shape. But again, the, the issue is the pressure from the rider through the stirrup leather into the stirrup bar it does pull down over the horse's back um so if you're sat in the saddle for the majority of the time that's not going to have the same amount of pressure as say jumping where you're putting a lot of pressure into your stirrup leathers and through the stirrup bar all the time so the, there are there are research done by the society of master saddlers on treeless saddles um that Yes, they, they can cause more pressure issues, but it depends upon what you're using it for. So our next question is, what to do if the saddle slides forward? Um, if it slides forward, it can be lots of reasons. Um, first of all, I would look at the girth system, because if the saddle's here and the girthing is over here, you need to make sure that the straps are coming at the angle for the girth because you don't want it to pull because the girth is forwards you don't want it to be dragging the saddle with it so you need to allow the straps to form a natural angle from the top of the saddle to the girth point there are the anatomical girths that are the shaped girths that help with a forward girth groove um, it could be that the saddle is too wide and it is sliding forwards it could be that the horse is what we term croup high so it's high at the back and low at the front and so it's pushing everything forwards so you might want to try a saddle that has more panel more lift at the front if the balance of the saddle is down you might want to lift it up at the front to get a better balance um, you can try grip saddle pads you can try non-elastic girths there's lots 
often it's a case of trial and error. It's not just a one fix solution. Thank you. So the next question is, what is the best way to find correct saddle for the rider with height of 178 centimeter and long legs? What is the common size should be? Okay, I had this was an interesting topic I had um, a few weeks ago about seat size and rider height. It's got nothing to do with seat size has nothing to do with how tall or how short a rider is nothing because you might have very short people with very small bottoms and you might have very short people with very large bottoms and the same with tall people so the seat size is about the size of your bottom so <laughs> then that's where we need to change the flap length or if it's a if it's a dressage saddle the flap length and sometimes the shape of the block for the rider can be changed if they're taller or shorter um, or if it's a jumping saddle a tall rider is probably going to want a more forward flap but just because they're tall doesn't mean they need a bigger seat the seat size is only in relation to your bottom size. <laughs> uh, so next question is, what shall I do if a saddle is moving around my quite uh, barrel shaped horse? OK, the, the rounder the horse, the more problems we have. <laughs> um, so no elastic on the girth. Have your girth straps as far apart as possible so that you have a point strap at the front and one right at the back. So you've got a better anchorage, a better balance um, for the girth. Um, sometimes make sure that the, the, the flock, if it is a wool flocked saddle, make sure that the wool flocking is not hard and firm. The soft it is the more cushioned it is the more it will mold to the shape of the horse's back um, and it will sort of sit into it and find a better stability um, again sometimes some saddle pads are better than others um, for helping with grip um, but yeah generally it's about the straps on the saddle if you just pull from the center you're going to allow everything either side to move so finding that balancing on the girthing and no elastic on your girth thank you and the next question is actually about elastic uh, uh lately i see more and more girth without elastic bands on sale is it better to use a girth without elastic or with elastic on both sides um so it depends on the type of horse that you have um if it is um a round horse like the previous question then definitely no elastic the elastic is elastic it's going to give it's going to stretch so if you want that saddle to stay still we don't want any extra stretch in the girth um if it's a regular sports horse shape then yes most people are more comfortable with elastic but both sides always both sides um but make sure it's not too much elastic because it can be overstretched. i think as riders we tend to like elastic on our girths because it makes it easier for us to do the girth up um personally i don't on my long girths i don't have elastic on my saddles on the girths for my saddles um it's probably more a rider choice but either elastic both sides or not at all. Thank you. Uh, next question. Is it possible that a young horse shakes uh, the head from a badly fitted saddle or, or the, saddles, uh, the saddle slides forward still the same way? Um, I mean, shaking the head could be any number of issues from a badly fitting bridle there's a lot of um information now on bridle fitting as well as saddle fitting um it could be the bit 
Um, it could be uncomfortable. It's probably, if there's no other, I wouldn't have thought that if there's no other signs of being uncomfortable in the saddle area, that the head shaking is just saddle related. Um, but if the saddle is slipping forwards, then yes, definitely. Um, you know, that's the time that you need to get a saddle fitter to come out and have a look at it and give you some advice. Um, you don't always need a new saddle. Sometimes, you know, those saddles can be adjusted. It's just they need a bit of adjustment to them to get a better balance. Um, sometimes there's a lot of um, pads on the market that have the, have the shims, the adjustable parts to them. So it might be that it's worth trying with one of these pads in it in the different sections so that you can see if that helps with the balance or with the sliding. Um, but it's when you need to get a saddle fitter out. If you're concerned about the saddle, um, we can check for the basics, but if you can't see anything obvious yourself, then that's when you need to get a saddle fitter out to come and check it. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about flexible trees for saddles? <sighs> All I can go on is the fact that a, ri a, a rigid tree, a, a wooden sprung tree, has the structure to take the pressure, um, the upward pressure from the horse moving, and then, then the downward pressure from the rider, and that's the best way of distributing the pressure throughout the saddle. As soon as that tree starts to have more movement in it, the more movement it has in it, the more places it will find to create a pressure point. For an example, if a, a saddle has had an accident and the tree has actually broken and it's snapped inside, then it will default to where the flex is in it and it will cause more pressure in that area. I think without any actual pressure testing over longer periods of time to test these, I don't know a definitive answer, but I can only go with what is science as far as the more um, structure the tree has to take and spread the weight pressure, the better that is therefore for the horse. Thank you. And uh, what do you think of saddle cushions? Uh, I'm not really sure what that means. Saddle cushions. Riser pads. It could be riser pads or saddle pads. Saddle pads. Okay, well, if um, when we're fitting saddles, we always advise the rider just to use a very simple cotton saddle cloth. It doesn't have to be a really thick one. Um, Again, we always sort of use the analogy that if your shoes fit you with regular socks and then you put really, really thick socks on, then they're going to feel tight. So we always advise that you just use a regular thin saddle glass. Um, this is where then there are lots of thicker pads on the market, just the saddle shape pads, the sheepskin pads. Um, and if you want to use these, then that's something you need to let your saddle fitter know because they might need to adjust for that in the width of the saddle or the flocking of the saddle. Um, there's lots of gel pads and all sorts of pads like that. Again, if the saddle fits, I don't use anything on my saddles other than a normal saddle cloth and the saddle. The wool has a really excellent compression rate um, and comfort for the horse. Um, you only really need to start using the pads, the adjuster pads, the different levels, the different heights of pads at the front and the back. If you've got a balance problem with the saddle and it's going to help the horse and help you as a rider, less is more. The less you have under your saddle, the closer the saddle that sits to the horse, the better the fit and the closer you will feel. Thank you. I think that we don't have questions anymore. Okay. Well, last, right. last chance, <laughs> last chance, everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, 
you know, if if anybody wants to message me offline about anything, I'm sure they can get my contact details from you. So um, I'm happy to try and answer any other questions, but in English, please. <laughs> Sure. So thank, thank you, Claire, and thank you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, thank you well. everyone, for being with us uh, today. We will take uh, uh, everything uh, offline. And uh, please, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop us a line. I will uh, forward uh, everything in English to Claire and Nikki and get back uh, the response for you. Uh, we are always happy to help, uh, help. I hope that you found this webinar useful. Uh, see you next time and uh, in our future events. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Thanks, everyone.